All right, thank you guys for coming out this morning. I wanted to welcome you. Uh, I'm Kathy Jones. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of the Tennessee Valley. We are so fortunate to have the constitutions on display here in Huntsville as part of our bicentennial celebration. And today we're going to hear a very important uh, presentation about the 1901 Constitution and how it's affected and continues to affect all of us in Alabama uh, with a particular regard to how it affects um, folks as it pertains to race, gender, and, and uh, economic status. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the Tennessee Valley, uh, the Huntsville Madison County Bicentennial Committee, and the uh, Alabama Ar Department of Archives and History. And so we're really honored to have uh, Julian Butler share his extensive knowledge of the 1901 Constitution. And I wanted to welcome him up here. And I did want to mention that we are recording today's presentation just so that we can share it. Thank you. Kathy, thank you very much. I want to introduce two people before we begin. Scotty Kirkland from the State Department of Archives and History is here with us today. Scotty is the person primarily responsible for the exhibit of the six constitutions downstairs. Scotty Kirkland. And the executive director of the Huntsville Madison County Bicentennial Committee, Sally Warden. So many of the things we have enjoyed and are enjoying would not have happened without Sally. Sally, thank you for all you do. I'm also delighted that State Representative Laura Hall is with us today. Laura. Before I begin my talk today, I want to give a disclaimer. <laughs> In my talk, I will express my opinions. And I want to assure you, these are my opinions. They're not the opinions necessarily of the League of Women Voters of the Tennessee Valley, the Department of Archives and History, the, the, our Bicentennial Committee, the Museum of Art. Some of them probably aren't even the opinions of my wife who is here with me. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to say as I get into this talk, particularly about what happened in 1901, there is some pretty rough language that was actually used at the time reflecting on African Americans. I apologize for that language in advance, but it is language you need to hear to fully understand the 1901 Constitution. I will use some terms that I want to define them ahead of time. I'll refer to the Black Belt. The Black Belt is that portion of Alabama beginning on the western border south of Tuscaloosa and extending in a diagonal southeast to Barber and Bullock counties. The reference, it is heavily populated by African Americans, but that is not where the term comes from. The term refers to the soil. It's rich black soil, which was perfect for raising cotton. For that reason, the plantations were there. They had the enslaved Americans, and after emancipation, the enslaved American state. So it does have a heavily African-American population, but the reference is to the soil. Second, I will refer to the wiregrass. That's that section of southeast Alabama around Dothan. As I understand it, the term comes from when they began to clear the land. The, the growth there was wiry and called wiregrass. I will refer to Bourbons or Bourbon Democrats, and I'm not talking about lawmakers that drink a lot. <laughs> the term Bourbon comes the royal party in France following the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era with the Bourbons. The term was used to describe the resurgent Democrats in Alabama after um, 
Reconstruction, primarily the black belt planters. The term, those who used the term used it one way or another. It was not always a complimentary term when used, but many of those to whom it was directed liked the term. And then I will refer to big mules. And the origin of big mules is somewhat obscure. Generally, it is thought that Governor Bib Graves used the term, but the term referred to the Birmingham, or primarily Birmingham, the industrialists, the coal, iron, and steel magnets, the railroads, their bankers, their lawyers, um, and throughout modern Alabama history the concept of the big mules and their influence on state politics. To fully understand the 1901 Constitution and why we got there, you've got to go back, Grace, one minute. I would be bad if I did not say, today is a really special day. The second day of August, 1819, Alabama's original Constitution was signed two blocks from here. The 44 delegates from the 22 counties of the Alabama Territory on the second day of August, 1819, signed the Constitution. Now, the 1819 Constitution in regard to suffrage was the most liberal in the United States. And in 82 years, from 1819 to 1901, we go from the most liberal constitution in the United States with regard to suffrage to the most restrictive constitution in the United States uh, in regard to suffrage. The constitution of 1868 was the Reconstruction Constitution. The uh, Civil War was over. The Freedmen's Bureau was in Alabama. Federal troops were in Alabama. To get back in the Union, Alabama had to pass a constitution that was satisfactory to Congress. And they passed the 1868 Constitution. Only constitutional convention where African Americans were elected, appeared, and voted. It enfranchised the newly freed slaves all across Alabama. You then go to the Constitution of 1875. The Freedmen's Bureau was gone, the troops were gone. The Bourbon Democrats were in ascendancy. And the 1875 Constitution was passed to begin to undo Reconstruction and what happened in 1868. The one thing the 1875 Constitution did not do, though, was disenfranchise black voters. The thought was there was still enough fear of the federal government. There were federal troops, I think, in Louisiana and other places. And there was the fear if they boldly disenfranchised black voters, that the federal government would reappear. And so they moved very slowly, although they took back over. You then had in the 1890s what we know now is the populist revolt. And it was a nationwide movement, an agrarian movement. And in Alabama, it was a coalition of African Americans, white yeoman farmers, and union members. And they were opposed to the Bourbon Democrats or the Big Mules or the Black Belt Planters, whatever you want to call. And the populist revolt was centered in North Alabama and in the Wiregrass against the industrialists in Birmingham and the plantation owners in the Black Belt. Its leader was a man named Reuben Cobb, K-O-L-B. And Reuben Cobb was the Commissioner of Agriculture of the State of Alabama. And he ran, at that time, a gubernatorial term was only two years. And Cobb ran for governor in 1892 and 1894. In 1892, he received about 120, I mean, the, the Bourbon candidate received about 126,000 votes. 
and Cobb received 115. It is largely believed, and then in 1894, he, uh, the Bourbon Democratic candidate received 111,000 votes and Cobb 83. There was a final populist candidate, Alfred Goodwin, who ran in 1896. None of the three were elected. It is generally believed that Cobb would have been elected governor except for widespread fraud and intimidation in the Black Belt. The Black Belt planters manipulated the newly freed um, slaves to vote really against their self-interest. But the rise of populism scared the heebie-jeebies out of the big mules, the planters, the bourbon Democrats. And they decided, we've got to do something about this. Um, we've got to disenfranchise African Americans. Um, the, and we've got to disenfranchise poor whites as well. And that's something that you ought to remember when you think about the 1901 Constitutional Convention. The object was not just disenfranchising African Americans. It was disenfranchise the yeoman farmers, the working farmers, in the hill country of North Alabama and in the wire grass. Um, on De in December 1900, the legislature passed an enabling act to provide for a vote on calling the convention. Election was held in April of 1901. There were 70,000 votes in favor and 45 votes against. 25 majority white counties, mostly in North Alabama, voted against having a constitutional convention. Five wiregrass counties also voted no. Uh, no. On May 21, 1901, 155 delegates met in Montgomery. 141 of them were Democrats, seven populists, six Republicans, and one independent. No blacks were elected to the 1901 Constitution Convention. And sadly, we've had six constitutional conventions. No woman was ever a delegate to any one of the six. No woman could vote in Alabama at the time they were at. The members included 96 lawyers, and that's probably what was wrong with the <laughs> 12 bankers, four journalists, several physicians, teachers, and engineers. 38 were Civil War veterans, and 45 had served in the legislature. John B. Knox, an Aniston attorney, whose name should be forever written in infamy, was elected the president of the convention. And he was a lawyer who represented the industrial interest of North Alabama. The convention met continuously with the exception of one week intermission until September 3rd. Ratification of the 1901 Constitution took place in November by a vote of 108 to 81,000. That close, 27,000 votes. The margin of victory came from the Black Belt counties. Thousands of African Americans were either fraudulently voted or were intimidated and manipulated. And they were voting against their own right to vote. Historians have largely concluded that its passage was the result of considerable fraud. Um, officials in the Black Belt claimed that nearly 30,000 African Americans voted to disenfranchise themselves. That's a whole statistic. In the three most popular counties in the Black Belt, only 500 people voted against ratification. Excluding the Black Belt region, the Constitution would have failed by 4,000 votes. Um, the vote on the 1901 Constitution, the ratification, showed a sectional um, alignment of long standing in Alabama with the North Alabama Hill Country and the Wiregrass against Birmingham and the Black Belt planters. 
in that division still exists to a large degree today, but certainly existed all through the 20th century. On November 28, 1901, Thanksgiving Day, the present Alabama State Constitution went into effect upon a proclamation of Governor Jefferson. The 1901 Constitution was lit, written primarily to disenfranchise blacks and poor whites. Literacy requirements and cumulative poll taxes that grew larger every year when they were not paid became the major barriers to popular suffrage. The poll tax is one of the most invidious things ever invented and I'm gonna talk a little more about it later. Just I look around the room, I may be the only person in this room that ever paid a poll tax. I paid a poll tax <laughs> when I registered to vote. But the poll tax was $1.50 a year, and you had to pay it before February of a year in which an election was held. But it was cumulative. If you missed it, didn't pay it, then you, it added up. If you that time you were 21 years old to be eligible to vote. If you didn't get around to registering to vote till you were 41, you had to pay 20 years poll tax in order to be entitled to vote. And while a dollar and a half does not sound like a lot, we're talking about 1901 dollars, and we're talking about 1934 dollars in the middle of the Depression and to poor white farmers barely getting by, to African-American sharecroppers in the black belt, it was an almost insurmountable barrier to voting. We think about the efforts today merely to get people to register and go to the polls to vote, but you add to it the burden of paying the poll tax. The other thing, was the literacy test. Local registrars were given wide discretion in registering people to vote. That still exists to an extent today. The Board of Registrars is a three-member board. If you read the statute, it says they're to be appointed by a committee of the governor, the state auditor, and the commissioner of agriculture and industry. And then those three decide who's chair. That isn't the way it works. The governor appoints one person, the commissioner of agriculture and industry appoints one person, and the state auditor appoints one person, and the person appointed by the governor is the chair. Obviously, you're going to get partisan political activists. And for a process that ought to be the most nonpartisan in the world, it isn't always that way. The, before literacy tests were abolished, they could examine people and require them to explain a section of the United States Constitution, which most lawyers I know probably would have a hard time doing. But what I'm about to tell you is an absolutely true story. I had a friend in college from Tuskegee, Macon County, a white man from a quote, quote, prominent family. When he became 21, he was told that he could meet with the Board of Registrars to register to vote. But he was told, he was given a date certain, and the Board of Registrars of Macon County met in the vault of the First National Bank of Tuskegee after hours. So nobody could be admitted and the records were kept in the vault of the First National Bank of Tuskegee. When I registered to vote in 1961 in Birmingham, was interested. The determination to restrict labor union members from voting still existed in Jefferson County. If you had a Homewood, a Mountain Brook, a Vestavia address and were white, it was no problem. But if you were white and had an Inslee, a Bessemer, a Tarrant City address, it was just as difficult to register to vote as if you were black. 
they did not want labor unions registering to vote. If you want to know what the 1901 Constitution was about, there is no better evidence than the words of John Knox, the president. And I'm going to apologize to Howard Bankhead and Joseph Lee and Laura Hall. The words I'm going to use are awful, but they were actually uttered by John Knox in his opening address to the 1901 convention. And what is it that we want to do? Why, why it is within the limits imposed by the federal constitution to establish white supremacy in this state. This is our problem and we should be permitted to deal with it, unobstructed by outside influences. But if we would have white supremacy, we must establish it by law, not by force or fraud. An interesting admission to the amount of fraud <laughs> used on the black belt. The provisions are justified in law and in morals because the Negro is not discriminated against on account of his race, but on account of his intellectual and moral conditions. There is in the white man an inherited capacity for government, which is wholly wanting in the Negro. That's the setting of the 1901 Convention. My wife suggested that I ought to flash a picture of Barack Obama behind me when I read it. <laughs> Malcolm McMillan, the Dean of the Scholars of Alabama Constitution, in his book, Constitutional Development in Alabama, which is the Bible of anybody studying Alabama's Constitution, wrote, the presence of the Negro in large numbers has been the most important factor in the constitutional history of the state. No major constitutional issue has faced the state since 1819 that has not been decided largely in the light of the presence of the Negro. The framers of the 1901 Constitution, as I said, devised property, literacy, good character, vagrancy, petty crimes, and poll tax provision to eliminate all the black vote and part of the white vote. Macmillan explains the 1901 Constitution's conservatism thus. It was dominated by conservatives a combination of delegates representing the Black Belt point of view and that of the railroads and industrialists from Birmingham and other cities. Their common interest was to keep the Negro, the pure white, populist, and organized labor under control. To understand what they did, you have to look at the comments after. Debbie Palmer, a delegate from Washington County, sent the pen with which he signed the Constitution to his granddaughter. He wrote, this will never be forgotten. We have virtually disenfranchised the Negro, reduced the taxes, and largely increased the school fund. The Montgomery Advertiser stated, the great incubus of unlimited Negro suffrage will undoubtedly be removed by ratification. This alone ought to uh, commend it to white voters. The Choctaw advocate concurred calling the document made by white men for white men. John Knox, the president, told a Bibb County audience, the Constitution would help maintain the proper relationship of the race. Knox proclaimed that the new Constitution eliminates the ignorant Negro vote and places control of our government where God Almighty intended it should be, with the Anglo-Saxon race. The ignorant and vicious Negroes in our midst should never have been invested with the right of suffrage, and it is our duty to protect ourselves against these dangers, which we have had ample experience. The supporters of the Constitution welcomed its victory. The Montgomery Advertiser headline was, The Citizens of Alabama Declare for White Supremacy and Purity of Ballot. The symbol of the Alabama Democratic Party 
until the 1960s, and listen to the date, the 1960s, was a rooster that said white supremacy for the right. And as black voters were registered to vote and wanted to vote Democratic, they had to vote under that symbol. <coughs> Before the Constitution was ratified, there were more than 180,000 black Alabamians who were eligible to vote. By 1903, fewer than 3,000 were registered to vote. The number of registered African American voters in 14 black belt counties fell 99% from 79,311 to 1,081. Although not as dramatic, the percentage of white voters were reduced also. The first attack on the 1901 Constitution came in 1903 when a man by the name of Jackson W. Giles, an African-American postman in Montgomery, filed a lawsuit. In a case that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, the court held that the lawsuit, there was a want of jurisdiction. The court didn't have the power to rule on it. And when you think of this, you think this is the same Supreme Court that had just five years earlier determined Plessy versus Ferguson, that separate but equal facilities for white and black, which were inherently unequal, but the Supreme Court said that met the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution. As I said, the primary vehicle was the poll tax. And you look at the history coming forward of the poll tax. And with all respect to Laura, who works like the devil to change things, the history of the poll tax and some of the other things I'm going to talk about are just the history of the Alabama legislature. The Poll tax was abolished in federal elections by the uh, 24th Amendment to the United States Constitution. And that was February 1964. Alabama did not ratify that amendment. The legislature refused to do so. It got the necessary two-thirds states to approve it, but Alabama was not the one off. Um, the in 1966, a three-judge federal court in Montgomery ruled Alabama's poll tax unconstitutional in state elections. Again, not the Alabama legislature, but a federal court. It's interesting, in 1996, the legislature finally got around to removing the provision from the Constitution <laughs> that established the poll tax even though it had not been in effect since 1966. Gender was also an issue at the 1901 Constitutional Convention. There were delegates there that actually were bold enough to propose allowing women to vote. Dallas County's Benjamin H. Craig favored the vote for women in their, on their own merits that women should be entitled to vote. He was in the minority. There were some delegates that supported giving women the right to vote because it would increase the number of white voters was the only rationale they could come up with to support giving women the right to vote. Um, 17 women from Madison County, all taxpayers, went to Montgomery to the convention, and they petitioned for the right to vote. We insist that those powers of government only are just which are derived from the consent of the governor. The consent of the women of Alabama in government affecting their rights and property can only be obtained by giving them the right of suffrage. Carrie Chapman, Kett, the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, wrote letters to delegates. After a very lengthy debate, and this really becomes funny, the Constitutional Convention decided, okay, 
We're going to give women the right to vote in one instance if they are property owners and there's a referendum on bonds, we will let them vote. But then the next day they thought better about it and went back and repealed it. So it didn't make it to the 1901 Constitution. One of the most dramatic days of the convention was on June 10th when Francis Griffin addressed the delegates on the topic of women's suffrage. There were attempts made to block her appearing before the convention and speaking. And there were various parliamentary maneuvers to keep her from speaking. When she finally rose to speak, the galleries were full of women in white dresses, their symbol, that had come to support the idea of women's suffrage. Um, she talked for a half an hour. She listed the many ways Alabama women had contributed to the growth and health of the state, underscoring the inherent unfairness of the lack of the franchise. The man without a vote is a subject, not a citizen. The woman without a vote is an inferior, not an equal. But her words fell on deaf ears. Um, when she said, so long as laws affect both men and women, men and women together should make those laws. And most of the legislators were silent. And boy, you gotta give her credit. She looked out and said, now why don't you applaud that? <laughs> I would love to have known her. I bet she was a piece of work. <laughs> Griffin closed her remarks by asking the delegates to confer Alabama upon Alabama's women the very right to vote that they intended to take away from African Americans. Women did not gain the right to vote in Alabama until, again, the Federal Government Act. The 19th Amendment was proposed in May of 1919, and it was proclaimed and ratified on August 26, 1920, it required two-thirds of the state to ratify. Tennessee, our neighbor, was the last of the required two-thirds to ratify. It's not going to surprise you. The Alabama legislature voted not to ratify the 19th Amendment. <laughs> Interestingly, and I've asked my historian scholar, Scotty Kirkland, why, and he can't find out. In 1953, Alabama ratified the 19th Amendment. Now, it had been in effect since 1920. <laughs> it was a largely symbolic act that somebody, maybe for political reasons, wanted to do. The leading organization in Alabama was the Alabama Equal, Equal <coughs> Suffrage Association. It was an affiliate of the National American Woman Suffrage Association and the National American Woman Suffrage Association became the League of Women Voters after 1920, as did the Alabama Equal Suffrage Association, which was founded in Birmingham in 1912. It ended its work and became the Alabama League of Women Voters. The potential of this organization was soon demonstrated when male political candidates started to show up at the state convention to be heard. Um, sadly, in the 1930s, the League of Women Voters in Alabama became a casualty of the Depression. As the economy collapsed, the League of Women Voters collapsed to be revived at a later time. When you think of the 1901 Constitution today, I just want you to focus. It is more than 50 times the length of the United States Constitution. It is the longest constitution in the United States, and there are scholars that believe it's the longest constitution in the world. <laughs> and I'm serious. The, night, the United States Constitution that came into effect in 1789 has had 27 amendments. The Alabama Constitution of 1901, at the current time, has 944 amendments. 223 of them relate statewide, 
721 address issues in local counties. But there are 20 more have been passed by the legislature and will be on the ballot at the next election, five statewide and 15 local. If there is anything that calls out for reform, it is the Alabama Constitution of 1901. I want to digress for just a minute and talk to you about women in government in Alabama. We've had two female United States Senators. In 1937, the United States Senator, Sorry. United States Senator Hugo Black was appointed to the United States Supreme Court. And prior to the election being held in 1938, Governor Bibb Graves appointed his wife, Dixie Bibb Graves, as the first female United States Senator. In 1978, United States Senator James B. Allen died. Governor Wallace appointed his wife, Marion Pittman Allen, to the United States Senate. She was on the ballot, ran in the Democratic primary in 1978, and was defeated. Although we've had two female United States Senators, we've never had an elected. We've had two governors, Lurleen Wallace in 1966, who was largely a stand-in for her husband that could not seek re-election. And then Kay Ivey, who became governor with the resignation of Robert Bentley. She was lieutenant governor and, of course, then in 19, uh, 2018 was elected governor in her own right. The Alabama legislature, there is an interesting history. The first woman elected to the Alabama legislature was a woman by the name of Hattie Hooker Williams um, from, the mob, I mean, from Selma, Alabama, Dallas County. She was active in the suffrage or, uh, movement and she was an organizer of the League of Women Voters in Alabama. She was elected to the Alabama House of Representatives in 1922 served one term and did not seek re-election. And one of the real pioneers in Alabama governance, a woman by the name of Sybil, Sybil Poole. In 1936, she was selected to fill the seat of a legislator who had resigned. She was elected to full terms in 38 and 42. Sadly, no woman was elected after Sybil Poo to the legislature until 1962. But Sybil Poo went on. Sybil Poo was the first woman to ever be elected to a statewide office in Alabama. She was appointed Secretary of State in 1944 and then was elected in 1946. The first time she ran, she carried 63 of Alabama's 67 counties. And she began what was sometimes called the round robin for women. You had three statewide offices, Secretary of State, State Auditor, and State Treasurer. And Sybil Poole, and at that time you could serve only one term. You could not succeed yourself. And Sybil Poole went from Secretary of State to State Treasurer and then ran for the Public Service Commission. But you began a long period that women ran for, and these were generally regarded as, quote, women's offices. And they would serve the Secretary of State and four years later run for State Treasurer and four years later run for State Auditor. You had women like Agnes Baggett, Mabel Amos, Melba Till Allen, Juanita McDaniel, Mary Texas Hurt Garner, that all did bring around the roses in those three offices. And sometime, more than one time, they started back around. You had an incredible woman named Annie Lola Price from Cullman, Alabama. Annie Lola Price did not have a law degree. She read law in a Cullman law office. And when James E. Folsom Sr., Big Jim, was elected governor, he took her to Montgomery as an assistant legal advisor and then made her his legal advisor. In January of 1951, as he was leaving office, he appointed her to a vacant seat 
on the Alabama Court of Appeals. And at that time, there was not a court of criminal appeals and a court of civil appeals, just a court of appeal. And she became the first woman ever to hold a statewide judgeship. She went on to be elected for four successive terms. When they divided the court, she became the chief judge of the Court of Criminal Appeal. A woman from Birmingham named Janice Shores was elected to the Alabama Supreme Court in 1974, was the first woman to ever be elected to the Supreme Court, and she served four six-year terms. And then I have to digress when you look at these women, particularly in judicial offices, to the issue of women on juries in Alabama. When I began the practice of law in Huntsville in 1966, women could not serve on juries in Alabama. I actually tried the first case in Decatur, Morgan County, where we had a woman on the jury. It came about again not by action of the Alabama legislature, but by a ruling of a three-judge federal court. The irony of it is, the first woman who ever was admitted to practice law in Alabama was a woman named Maud McClure Kelly, who was admitted to practice law in October of 1908. She could practice law, but she couldn't serve on a jury. When Annie Lola Price was appointed to the Court of Appeals, she could rule on cases, but she couldn't serve on the jury. The anomaly of the treatment of women by Alabama comes close to its treatment of African American citizens. The two most significant movements in Alabama in the 20th century, I think unquestionably, are the women's suffrage movement and the civil rights movement. But the battle isn't done. We still have racist language in the Alabama Constitution. It, section 256, as amended by section, Amendment 111, provides that parents can choose what schools their children go to. Parents who de desire that such minors shall attend schools provided for their own race. This was the Boutwell Freedom of Choice Bill passed after Brown versus Board of Education integrated the schools to allow parents to avoid integrated schools. Although that has been struck down, it still remained in the Alabama Constitution. <coughs> Language to remove it has been on the ballot in 2004 and again in 2012. And the enlightened voters of Alabama voted it down both times to remove the language. There will be a proposal on your ballot next year that would give the director of the Legislative Services Agency the right to recommend to the legislature in part of a reconciliation of the entire code to move racist language. That's kind of an end run around the votes that have occurred. I urge you, go to the polls and vote for that amendment. I want in closing to play real tribute to the League of Women Voters. I know of no organization in my life that has been more involved in progressive causes in Alabama. You are a wonderful asset to the state of Alabama and a very essential asset. And it's always fascinating to me that your beginnings came out of the woman's suffrage movement. I'm going to open the floor for questions, but I want to give a commercial first. I know many of y'all went through the exhibit of Alabama's Sixth Constitution. There is a book, the author of the book, Scotty Kirkland's here, prepared by the State of, uh, Department of Archives and History. It's one of the finest things I've ever read. 
It is the story, beautifully illustrated, of Alabama's Sixth Constitution. It's on sale in the gift shop for $14.95, I think, but um, it's something I think if you're interested in the Constitution. And I want to express my appreciation to the Huntsville Museum of Art and to the State Department of Archives and History for the exhibit of Alabama's six constitutions. Yes, they ought to be here because the first one was adopted here, but they ain't gonna be anywhere else except Montgomery and Huntsville. It's really special that the State Department of Archives and History chose to bring the exhibit to Huntsville and that the Museum of Art allowed it to be on display here. The Art Cap said we're not going anywhere else but the Art Museum because of the control of light and humidity and all of that. But those are the original six documents, and the exhibit tells a wonderful story of the Constitution. With that, I'll open the floor for questions. Question. Yes. Um, sir, you made reference to the book that was considered the definitive guide to the Constitution. So yeah. I didn't get that. The author is Malcolm McMillan. The book is out of print. It's dates from the 50s, but reissued in the 70s. You can still find it. Um, usually a used copy, and the title was Constitutional Development in Alabama, 1798 to 1901. But Malcolm Cook Macmillan, M-C-M-I-L-L-A-N. Yes, sir. Could you talk about the, the parties in Alabama as far as the changes that happened with the Dixiecrats and... Okay. The Republican Party in Alabama originally was the party of Reconstruction. It was Lincoln's party. And as I say, when the 1875 Constitution came in and you had the resurgence of the Bourbon Democrats, Alabama became a Democratic state and remain that way. And again, when I began voting, Republicans in Alabama did not have a primary. You had a Democratic primary, and the election of whoever won the Democratic primary was tantamount to election in the general election. In 1948, at the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia, Hubert Humphrey, the mayor of Minneapolis, who had just been elected, the Democratic, or just won the Democratic nomination for the Senate in Minnesota, came to the floor of the Democratic Convention with a uh, very strong civil rights platform. His rousing speech in support of it caused a walkout of Southern delegates, many Southern delegates. The Alabama delegation split. Two United States Senators, Lister Hill and John Sparkman, stayed in the convention, as did Delegate George Corley Wallace from Barber County, Alabama, surprisingly, did not walk out. The walkouts came to Birmingham and had a convention at the Birmingham Municipal Auditorium. Um, I think they called themselves the States' Rights Party, but they were generally known as Dixiecrats. They ran uh, then Governor Strom Thurmond of South Carolina for, gov for president and then Governor Fielding Wright of Mississippi for vice president. Uh, the Dixiecrats carried four southern states, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And that began a split in the Democratic Party um, that existed throughout the 60s, whatever. In 1965, when Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act, President Johnson said, this is the end of the Democratic Party in the South. And to some extent, that was true, that 
you began then with the resurgence, if you will, of a very different Republican Party until we have today, where every statewide elected official is a Republican. One thing about women running for office, and this would have been interesting, in 2018, when Kay Ivey was running for governor, one of the two candidates in the Republican primary for lieutenant governor was a very popular female, President of the Public Service Commission. One of the main candidates for Attorney General was a female. And one of the candidates for Chief Justice Supreme Court was a female who had been appointed to that position. Alabama stood the chance that its four top officials, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, and the attorney general would all be female. It didn't happen, but there was a chance. Kathy, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, there have been several efforts to change from have another constitution. What do you think, why has that not happened? The special interest in Alabama who have engraved into the Constitution. Don't want to let it go. You've had movements to do so in, and I can't pull the date out, it was 80 something. The Alabama legislature actually passed a Constitution. And it was challenged in court and the Alabama Supreme Court in its ultimate wisdom determined that you could not pass, the legislature couldn't pass a whole constitution. All they could do was call a constitutional convention or amend it article by article, which we've been trying to do for a long time. But I doubt you heard any candidate for the legislature or few or for any statewide office talk in 2018. I am committed to having a new constitution for Alabama. It's not been an issue. It is my opinion, and I want to stress this is my opinion, that until a popular governor in their second term, when they can't seek re-election, bets the whole farm, brings all the power of the governor's office to call a constitutional convention, we are not going to have a new constitution. Yes, sir. Sir, I am concerned about the effort to remove the racial language in the Constitution because I think that it is cosmetic and is not going to change uh, the, the facts of, of how people are treated. I don't disagree with you, but I think it is one of those cosmetic things. And the way this proposal just allows it to be part of the overall reconciliation of the Alabama, the Code of Alabama, and as a way to remove it without it becoming as hot an issue as it has been before. But I agree with you. It's purely cosmetic. Yeah. So with 944 amendments, I believe you said, to, to the 1901 Constitution, where do our legislators go to find out what the baseline is? <laughs> sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Um, I started to bring my copy of the 1901 Constitution. Um, you look at the U.S. Constitution about this thick and you look at the Alabama Constitution about that thick. Gary, it is a problem. It's a problem for lawyers. And, and you will have an amendment and it relates back and it is a huge problem. Somebody, how? Um, the author of a paper that's in this, these words, uh, what that stem from, that has appeared on the race of the life of the person, what did we do to hate so much as we try to do so well? You think the author of hate come from? That's in these words. You understand that? Not that we said. Where did the hatred that was in the fear? Fear. Fear. Fear of what? Fear of loss of power. 
fear that, as I said, you have, if studying the 1901 Constitution, you cannot overlook the populist revolt and the fear that the entrenched economic interest in Alabama, the industrialists, the plantation owners, had that a coalition of African Americans, poor whites, and labor unions would take over the state. And that was the real motivation behind, I think, the 1901 Constitution. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for this presentation. Based on your historical knowledge of how everything has happened, can you give us advice on, given what we have now in this mess, what are the best steps we can take as voters and advocates to help stop the frauds, pressure, and disenfranchisement, these ridiculous tricks? Uh, how is the best thing we can do now? First of all, anytime a candidate comes to you and says, I'm running for the Alabama legislature, I'm running for attorney general, I'm running for something, first question, where do you stand on constitutional reform? What will you do to bring about a new constitution for Alabama? And secondly, to stay on top of things that are going on and say something when they don't. Write your legislators, write the governor, whatever. Let people know that you're paying attention. Yes, ma'am. Um, um, you had evidence of um, voter intimidation and fraud. The problem is that pesky United States Supreme Court case. That's what the postman did in 1903, and he attacked it on that basis. And the federal courts would not. There are those that say that ought to be a, a mode of attack on the 1901 Constitution. Unfortunately, 118 years later, the evidence of that probably no longer exists. Uh, although historians write about it, to have the kind of evidence you would need in a court to prove it, I don't think any longer exists. Joseph. Thank you. Um, I think you have a very good job. I really appreciate you. And I appreciate uh, what you have done as part of the uh, 200 members of the state. In terms of being inclusive and having diverse participation, in a, uh, in a state that left the union, in a state that was, uh, I'm not going to speak, but you, you know the state we're in. But we're here in 2019, and I've looked about my son, my grandson is visiting this week from Boston, and I want to ask this question to you, and I know you may not have an answer, but this is sort of part of the question I've been planning to call you about, by the way. I, I'm a member of the Alabama Historical Commission, Black Heritage Council, and I have been asked to represent the Philip Congressional District. And I received calls about the history of African Americans in this state and the Philip Congressional District. And one of the things that my grandson was asking me, you talk about the 1901 Constitution, Reconstruct there. He said, where, where are all the symbols of the African Americans who were elected during Reconstruction? Where are their pictures? How can I find out about them? You did a very eloquent job of giving the history of African Americans in the state. But it's not being shared in our school system. Uh, I don't know where you can go and find it unless we have persons like you or one of my books about it. We are not educating our public about the real history of the state. And I really appreciate what you have done. And I don't know if that's a question of this state. Joseph, thank you. I want to commend the State Department of Archives and History who have made some real movement in that way. And this exhibit, the photographs in this exhibit of the Constitution, you look at 1875 and it's interesting. 
there, Scotty had me, five black delegates standing up in a corner. They walked out and would not sign the Constitution. But those kind of illustrations, and within the Department of Archives and History, they are working hard at it. But you're absolutely right. There's a huge section of, of our history that should be addressed better than it is. I wanted to just, I wanted to put a plug in for a meeting that's going to be on August the 15th. Um, here, it's going to be at Early Works, but the uh, next year is the 100th anniversary of the um, 19th Amendment. And uh, on the 15th of August, we're having a meeting, um, informational meeting, and there, it's for the public. Uh, we're trying to find better ways to basically get the word out, not only about the fact that it's the 100th anniversary of women gaining the right to vote, but also um, talking about the issues. Alabama's story is not, not real, obviously not real, not real good some, in some, a lot of ways. And so we wanted to tell the whole story of the struggle to vote and, and the league is actually also, as a part of our local league and then at the state league level, we're working on trying to um, basically tell the story of the struggle to vote in Alabama. And um, I would just welcome everybody to put that on their calendar. Um, I, can, I can just tell you right now, it's... Um, just a second, I'm gonna tell you, so I'm gonna tell you wrong. It's the, um, it is, it's on the 15th. It's for, at three o'clock in the afternoon, and it's at the Early Works uh, Museum, um, 404 Madison Street. If you go onto the Alabama Archives uh, Facebook page, this event is on there. It's also on our league Facebook page. But um, I would encourage, that, you know, some of the questions you've gotten today. I mean, we need to be. We need to be thinking about how to raise awareness, especially since 2020 is a, a big election year. We want to make sure that people recognize the sacrifices and the hardships that have, people have had for voting. And, uh, and I would also welcome any of you um, to join us, either join the league or just, you know, help us tell the story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.